Hey friends, Anne here. Welcome back to worship. I am so glad that you have joined us today for worship. We are in the middle of our Philippians series where we are reading through the book of Philippians over the next couple of weeks in our Sunday worship time. So I hope that you will grab your Bible, grab a journal and a, and a pen or some sort of paper and a pencil and take some notes as we journey through Paul's letter to the church at Philippi together. Today, we are going to be in chapter 1, verses 12 through 30, and we're going to be exploring a difference in perspective. And to get us started in our thinking, what I have are a couple of quiz questions for you, okay? So you can comment in the comments what you see first, okay? So in this picture, do you see a piece of cake on a plate or do you see a whole cake with one piece cut out of it? What do you see? What is your perspective? And maybe you can begin to see both of them now that I'm talking about it. Um, or here's another one. What do you see in this picture? What is your first reaction to what do you see? Do you see a bunny or do you see a duck? Or can you see both of those things depending on how you are looking at that picture? And here's our last one. So in this shape, do you see arrows pointing in or do you see arrows pointing out? What is it that you pick up on first? What is it that you first notice? Arrows in or arrows out? You can tell us in the comments. So here's the thing that I think is really interesting is that in life, we see our circumstances through a particular perspective. So we can see the same situation. You and I can go through the same situation or be looking at the same picture and we can see something totally different because we have a different perspective. I'm seeing it one way, you're seeing it another way. I'm seeing it through the lens of my experience, you're seeing it through the lens of your experience. And today we're going to explore how Paul sees things differently than many of us would see things and how his perspective is more like Christ's perspective and how we can learn to become more like Jesus in the way that we see our circumstances and the way we deal with our reality. So go ahead and let's jump into Philippians chapter 1. And we're going to start with verse 12, and it says this. And I want you to know, my dear brothers and sisters, that everything that has happened to me here has helped to spread the good news. For everyone here, including the whole palace guard, knows that I am in chains because of Christ. And because of my imprisonment, most of the believers here have gained confidence and boldly speak God's message without fear. So friends, the first thing that I want you to notice is that there is potential in every situation, in every circumstance, in every problem, there is something good that can come out of it. Notice that what Paul is saying here is that everything that has happened to him, remember, he is in chains, he is in prison in Rome under house arrest right now. So even though he is held captive by Rome, Home, notice what he says in that um, in verse 13. He says this, um, everyone here, including the whole palace guard, knows that I am in chains because of Christ. Friends, you and I might say, well, that's not really accurate because Paul was in chains because of the Roman guards that put him in chains. Or Paul was in chains because of the people who initially accused him of something that he didn't even do. Or Paul was in chains because of whatever it is. But friends, what I want you to realize is that Paul has a different perspective of his problems. He actually says that he is in chains because of Christ, because he has been able to use his circumstance. He has been able to communicate to the palace guard and to provide a witness to them of the wonder and the majesty of Christ, where that would not have been possible had he not been in chains. 
So instead of seeing his chains as a cause of Roman oppression, instead of seeing his chains as a punishment or a problem, he actually sees the potential in his chains, in his problem. He sees that he has been given the ability to do something that without those chains, he would not have had the opportunity to do. Everything that has happened has been used by God to spread the good news of Christ. Here's the first perspective shift that we learn from Paul is that we can see the potential in every problem. So what are the problems that are in your life? Usually when we're in the midst of problems, we see limitations. We don't see potential. Usually we see all the things that we can't do and all the things that our problems are keeping us from instead of seeing all the things that our problems are enabling us to do. Paul sees the potential in his problem. Do you see the gospel potential in your problem? Do you see the way that God has positioned you in the middle of your pain and in the middle of your problem with the potential to spread the good news, with the potential to impact other people in a way that you would not have outside of that problem? This is a really important perspective shift for us. See the potential in every problem. Now let's keep reading and see if we can learn about some other perspective shifts that Paul makes. In verse 15, he says, It's true that some are preaching out of jealousy and rivalry, but others preach about Christ with pure motives. They preach because they love me, for they know I have been appointed to defend the good news. Those others do not have pure motives as they preach about Christ. They preach with selfish ambition, not sincerely, intending to make my chains more painful to me. But that doesn't matter whether, the, whether their motives are false or genuine. The message about Christ is being preached either way, so I rejoice. And I will continue to rejoice. Friends, notice that Paul is addressing this situation that is going on in the church where they are accusing some people of saying they're preaching the gospel with impure motives. Notice that their motives were jealousy and rivalry out of selfish ambition, and they're doing it in a way that actually is trying to bring Paul more pain in his chains and in his problem. And he talks about how their motives are false. And you would think that Paul would condemn those people that were preaching the gospel from impure motives. But instead, what Paul says is, look, it doesn't matter. Whether you're preaching the gospel with impure or false motives, or whether you're preaching the gospel with pure motives, either way, the gospel is going forth. Either way, the gospel is being proclaimed. And either way, God is able to work and the Holy Spirit is able to have an impact on people's lives. And the things that I think we can learn from this is that God moves despite our motives. Even when our motives are not pure, even when other people are talking about Jesus and they are not cleansed on the inside perfectly, that they are doing it with a heart of pride or with a heart of ambition or greed. Friends, the gospel is still going forth and God can continue to move despite our motives. So we shouldn't go around and point fingers at other people who are preaching the gospel that we think they have impure motives. We should just be like Paul rejoicing. And, and he talks about um, the message about Christ is being preached either way, so I rejoice and I will continue to rejoice. Friends, if the gospel is going forth, even if it's from an impure motive on the part and the, of the person that is delivering this message, God is still moving. So we should rejoice in the fact that the gospel is going forth and that God is going to be able to move, move in the hearts and the minds of the hearers and move in the hearts and the minds of the person, of the people that are delivering this, that he will change their motives and that he will transform the hearts and the minds of the people who have heard it.
So instead of pointing fingers at people that we think are doing gospel work with impure motives, what we need to be doing is praising that God's word is going forth and praising that God has the opportunity to work in people's hearts and minds. Because friends, God moves despite our motives. So let's go ahead and read on. Those are two perspective shifts, and we have three more that we're going to take a look at. Verse 19 says this, For I know that as you pray for me and the Spirit of Jesus Christ helps me, this will lead to my deliverance. For I fully expect and hope that I will never be ashamed, but that I will continue to be bold for Christ as I have, as I have been in the past. And I trust that my life will bring honor to Christ, whether I live or die. Friends, that is a bold statement that Paul makes here. He says, I fully expect and hope that even in the midst of what I'm doing, even if I die, no matter what happens, that my life will bring honor to Christ that I am living this moment in this pain, in this problem, and I can have hope because I trust in God's plan and purpose for my life. Friends, that is a bold statement when we're in the middle of pain and trouble and heartache and disappointment. That's a really hard statement to make when we're in the middle of mess and problem and difficulty because we often just see the pain and the problem and we don't take the time to raise ourselves up from that, poke our head up out of the pain and look at the Father and say, I trust you. I trust you. And the reason that I have hope in the middle of my problem is not because I can get myself out of it, but because I know you have a purpose for my life. I know there is a point to the pain and I trust you. And that trust in Jesus, that trust in the Father's plan and purpose for our life brings Paul hope. So what is the perspective shift that we learn from this? Is that we should hope always, in all circumstances, no matter what, because we trust that our Father has our best interest in mind. We trust that there is a purpose and a reason for our pain, that he has placed us there for a reason, and it is for our good, and we trust him, so we can hope always. So let's go on. We have two more perspective shifts that we're going to see from Paul. In verse 21, he says this, For to me, living means living for Christ, and dying is even better. But if I live, I can do more fruitful work for Christ, so I really don't know which is better. I'm torn between two desires. I long to go and be with Christ, which would be far better for me, but for your sakes, it is better that I continue to live. Knowing this, I am convinced that I will remain alive so I can continue to help all of you grow and experience the joy of your faith. And when I come to you again, you will even have more reason to take pride in Christ Jesus because of what he is doing through me. Friends, Paul is here and he's making a very big statement about his present and his future. And he's saying, hey, I'm having a hard time deciding which would be better. I mean, if I'm here, I'm able to share with you and spread the gospel and that's good and it's good for you. But actually, it's better for me if I go ahead and die and I'm with my Savior. He's looking at everything that he's going through through the lens of eternity. And he's saying, hey, my life today has purpose and it has meaning and it's good because I'm doing God's work. But also there is a life for eternity that I'm also looking forward to. 
And friends, we often look at death as if it's the end of what we're going through, as if death is the solution for our pain and our problems. And what Paul is saying is our pain and our problems, there is still potential in that. And there's still a reason for me to be here in order to help you and serve you and instruct you in the faith. But even better, if I die and go on to be with Christ. Do you have that same outlook on life? That life here is good, but eternity with Christ is better? Here's the perspective shift that I want us to think about. From Paul's point of view, life in Christ brings eternal joy. And that eternal joy is not just for one day when he's with Christ, but he's saying it's here and now. That eternal joy starts now when I'm here on the earth and living out my future, living out the present, the purpose that God has for me. This eternal joy that we experience when we have life in Christ is for now and for later. Friends, I hope you know that even in the middle of the pain and the problems and the difficulty that Paul was facing, he still experienced joy. As a matter of fact, this book, this letter to to the church at Philippi, to Philippians, to the Philippians, is actually called the book and the letter of joy because Paul, in the midst of his pain, is experiencing eternal joy that starts now in the present, in his life right now, and moves on into eternity. Whether he lives or whether he dies, he is going to experience the joy of living with and for Christ. And there's one more perspective shift that I want us to look at. And that is in verses 27 through 30. And it says this, above all, so overall, summing everything up. You must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. Then, whether I come and see you again or only hear about you, I will know that you are standing together with one spirit and one purpose, fighting together for the faith, which is the good news. Don't be intimidated in any way by your enemies. This will be a sign to them that they are going to be destroyed, but that you are going to be saved, even by God himself. For you have been given not only the privilege of trusting in Christ, but also the privilege of suffering for him. Have you ever thought about suffering as a privilege? We are in this struggle together. You have seen my struggle in the past, and you know that I am still in the midst of it. Friends, this is another bold statement of Paul. He sees his suffering as a privilege, that he is privileged, he is honored to be able to suffer for Christ and to be able to do that in a way that reflects Christ's own suffering for us. The perspective shift that I want us to see here is that Christ brings security in our suffering. He helps us see that because of the suffering that he did for us on the cross, that when we suffer, we can become like him. And that there is security in our suffering. It's not chaotic. It's not outside of his control. That he suffered with a purpose. And in that same way, when he allows us to suffer and to experience trials and to experience um, hardship, that there is a purpose in that. And that suffering brings us security because of who we are in Christ. Friends, if you're going through trials right now, I don't want you to think that I'm saying that trials and troubles are easy. But I do want you to flip your perspective and to not just focus on the trouble and the trial, but to flip your perspective and focus on Christ who suffered for you and for me for the forgiveness of our sins. And when we are going through suffering, there is a purpose. There is a reason. We can have joy and hope in the midst of it because we know that our perspective is eternal. It's not temporary. 
and that Christ is the one that brings this security. It brings this purpose. It brings this certainty to our suffering because we know that it is only temporary. We know that it is but a drop of the suffering that Christ himself experienced for us. And so friends today, I don't know what your trial is. It may be that you don't know where you're gonna get your next meal. It could be that you're in a job that feels pointless and useless. It could be that you're in a relationship that is toxic and abusive. It could be any number of things that you don't know how to provide for your family, that you're in debt, that you feel lonely, that you're depressed, that you feel all alone. Friends, I want you to know that there is potential in your pain and in your problem, that there is joy and hope, there is certainty and security because we have an eternal perspective. We can have this perspective that Paul has where we see that our pain has a purpose and find security in our suffering because we know and have hope and we trust in God because God is making a way for us through that pain. Friends, will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this reminder. We thank you for this reminder from a person like Paul who was in chains and who was enslaved, who was under the watch of the Praetorian Guard. And even in the midst of his problem and his pain and his persecution, he could trust and hope in you. And in that trust and hope, he could find certainty and security. He could find a purpose for his pain and joy and hope and life everlasting. Father, wherever we are suffering, wherever we are in the midst of our own pain, Help us to adopt your perspective. Help us to adopt Paul's perspective, to be able to see the purpose, to be able to see you walking us through this and find hope and security for the future. In your name I pray, amen. of kindness you have poured out grace you have brought me out of darkness you have filled me with peace giver of mercy you're my help in time of need Lord I can't help but sing faithful you are faithful forever you will be faithful you are and all your promises are yes and amen and all your promises are yes and amen I 
confidence is your faithfulness and I will rest in your promises my confidence is your faithfulness and I will rest in your promises is my confidence is your faithfulness faithful you are faithful forever you will be faithful you are and all your promises are yes and amen Says a yes and amen. So friends, today we have heard that your pain is not pointless, but there is a purpose to your pain, to your suffering, to your problem. And I want you to remember that in the middle of your suffering, you don't need to focus on the pain and all that you're experiencing in that pain, but you can look up. And you can focus on Christ, who is the one that brings hope and meaning and purpose, even in the midst of your pain. And you can rejoice that your hope is in him today and into the future. Have an eternal perspective on your problem and your pain. And friends, don't forget, we are continuing to go through the book of Philippians in our worship time, and you will see a reading guide that we'll post after this service post that will guide you in some reading. Throughout the week, we're going to be skipping around in scripture, and we're going to be reading more about a topic than we are from a particular book. So get your reading guide and make sure you're joining us for our daily reading. We'll be posting some reflections about that each and every day in our Facebook group, on Instagram, and, um, and on TikTok as well. And we look forward to engaging you in conversation about that. And don't forget to join us back next week for the continuation of our Philippians series. Friends, have a blessed day, and I'll see you again very soon. Your promises is my confidence is your faith.